Today, we are discovering the secrets of how Survivor began, what went into getting it all started, and even some random tidbits on how the production has changed to this day. As the show is now going on 42 seasons, it seems silly that it was ever considered to not happen, and yet, like any TV show starting from nothing, that was the case. Networks rejected it, CBS only wanted one episode to test the waters, it sounds silly now, but the show was completely unproven. There needed to be a lot of things put into place to make the rocket take off. This Secrets episode will be a bit different from any other Secrets video I have ever made, since it isn't really focused on one season in particular, but on the show as a whole, though Borneo will be mentioned quite a bit since most of the pre-Survivor talks are in relation to getting the season off the ground. But this episode is not about Borneo, that is for another time. Basically, as long as it isn't part of the show aired on television, everything here is fair game to be considered a secret. So with that, I want to thank you for watching what I make and ultimately supporting what I do here with liking, commenting, and sharing. For only a few bucks a month on Patreon, you can pick what videos I make, watch all of this channel's content early, chat with other fans of the show, and even get exclusive videos every month. Thank you for your support. Heads up, this list contains the secrets that I personally found to be the most interesting. They are not every secret in existence about how the show is made. These are just the ones that I like the most. So with that, let's count all 35 of them in absolutely no particular order. Number one, let's start our behind the scenes secrets with something that is very applicable to modern seasons before we jump back in time to how the show originated. Because around the time of season Season 26, Jeff was asked about if this show could go on forever, and in the interview, he says the main thing standing in the way of that happening would be cost. But he has one idea for a solution on how to solve that. Keep in mind, this is pre-Fiji, so when he says Survivor Island, just replace that word with Fiji. And it's eerie how accurate this is. But if you were willing to play it down and make it smaller, and buy an island somewhere in Panama and call it Survivor Island and do the same challenges every year and not have all the expenses of travel, this show will work for a long time. It's endlessly fascinating to watch how we behave in certain situations. And you never get the same game ever because you never have the same dynamics. Even if you took the same 16 people from season one and played again, the day you had finished, you'd get a different game. Because I'm a different person now. Tomorrow I'll be yet a different person. Number two. As you may or may not know, Survivor is not a show that is wholly original with no inspiration. It is in fact based on a show from Sweden called Expedition Robinson, which at the time was so low budget that they couldn't even afford to film at night. Well, how it all began, the original format of Survivor was uh, started in the UK and this guy Charlie Parsons. And I'm pretty sure it was a four day experiment for a local morning talk show where he just took, I think it was two or three couples and put them on an island for a few days. And that was sort of the seeds of this idea of like, oh, maybe you could do this. And they did a season in Sweden and it was a massive hit, it was very different from our show in that it was a tiny budget, had no fire, they couldn't shoot at night. Mark took Survivor and Mark Burnett took Survivor and blew it up. Number three. In a few past Secrets videos, I have shown some small segments from the Dream Team. They are a group hired specifically to help build, rehearse, and test out challenges, the ones you see in every episode. And if you didn't know they existed, you in fact have seen them in almost every episode of the show, as when Jeff explains what the challenge is before the castaways actually do it, those people purposely are not showing their faces. Yeah, that's the Dream Team. And in season one, there was no dream team. So we've been doing the dream team basically since season two. Okay. Season one. <laughs> season one, we get out there and, and we don't know what's going on. We have a skeleton crew. So when we had to test or rehearse the challenges, it was me and Jeff and Mark Burnett, our producers, our, our uh, kitchen help, you know, anybody, you know, we had little Malaysian kids, you know, it was just anybody we could get to do it. Anyway, we quickly learned we need people that do this because because yeah. all of a sudden I, I felt like I was uh, the door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman. I'd, I'd knock on the door. Oh, hide. I don't know. No, I can't. I can't. Number four. Les Moonves is no longer with CBS for allegations of a sexual nature. This video is not about that, but I am mentioning it now since he left the company in 2018. But this interview is circa 2007, around the time of seasons 13 and 14. So as the head of CBS at the time, here's how he talks about how Survivor 
Driver was originally pitched and how he thought this would not work on network television. You know, and he basically pitched me in 30 seconds Survivor. And my first reaction was, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. This is not a cable network. This doesn't belong on CBS. You know, you could have 16 people on a desert island and one of them's gonna get thrown off every week. Um, but to his credit, he was very persistent. He really believed in this show. And it actually, in fairness to him, it took a lot of guts to keep coming to my office with an idea that I clearly was not responding to. Number five, this next one is cool as it does explain why the show has worked and they have never felt the need to script anything like you see in other quote unquote reality shows like Duck Dynasty. Personalities are key and the show is built on them. And since I already made a secrets video about Pearl Islands, I am including an extra bit that I am 99% sure is less talking about Dara. Trying to get build the most drama through personality. You know, it's not building through script, but building through personality, you know, or in subsequent years, put, you know, this this 21 year old mortician from the South, from Alabama or Mississippi, who really didn't like being around black people, really had a, her prejudice was on her sleeve and having her there with, with black and seeing, you know, it really was a game and a social experiment at the same time. Number six, you may think, you know, Survivor, but, uh, did you know that at one point it was conceived to be a billionaire living on a yacht who eliminated people one at a time that lived on an island? Yeah. So while I was pitching Eco Challenge and Lauren had told me this really, what she thought, nutty idea, but they had potential that the idea was there was like a billionaire on a yacht offshore of an island. A number of people would be on that island and through the game, billionaire on the yacht would eliminate people week by week from the island. That was the essence of um, what I was told. Number seven, CBS was not the first channel this show was pitched to. Oh no. In fact, it was one of, if not the last channel it was pitched to. CBS was not a ratings juggernaut at the time. Originally, Mark Burnett pitched the show to the Discovery Channel. And let me tell you, if they had ended up producing it, it would not have been as popular and still wouldn't be on TV today. You know, I, I felt a sense of loyalty to Discovery Channel and met with Mike Quattron, who was the head of programming then at Discovery Channel and pitched him this vision I had. And they rejected it as if, you know, it was a, a nutty idea and wouldn't work. Number eight, how did Jeff Probst hear about Survivor and decide to apply as a host? Well, apparently Mark Burnett, the madman, was openly talking about the show on the radio, which included what the format of the show was gonna be and how he envisioned it taking place. I hear Survivor, uh, being talked about on the radio. Mark Burnett was on the Jonathan Brandmeier radio show and I was driving on the 405 and here's this guy that sounds British or Australian, I can't really tell, but he goes, uh, it's a crazy idea. I'm gonna take 16 people and I'm gonna leave them on an island and they have to work together and then every three days they vote somebody out and at the end the people come back and they're the jury and one person gets a million dollars. It's a brilliant concept. And I'm in the car going, That's oh my good. God, it is a brilliant concept. I gotta get in on this. Number nine, Jeff Probst wanted this job bad. He was a no-name guy who had the chops but no selling appeal. This is according to people like Les Moonves. Meaning shows cannot tout him as their host and that is usually a selling point for a new show to hook in casual viewers. Thankfully for Jeff, this show wasn't going in that direction and he made an impassioned plea to be the guy. And so I had like 15 minutes left and I, had a picture and resume there and I, I, I said, let me just, this, this is not me. I'm not a studio guy. I'm a writer, I've been in therapy, I get this show. I am the guy. And it was this big impassioned moment, you know, to rip your picture up was this huge thing. And Mark goes, very nice to meet you. I was like, I, and I leave and I'm thinking, how can this be? I'm so connected to this show. Number 10. So how did Jeff Probst's actual pitch go before that impassioned plea? What got him in the door and ultimately made Mark Burnett want him over anyone else? And an interview I did with Sandra Bullock, there was this one little interview on my demo tape. Okay. And I had interviewed her for Access Hollywood and she had really just been generous in giving me a fun interview. And we flirted, you know, pretend flirting. Right but it played as though we had this great connection. 
and Mark saw it and he said, and then it was this interview with Sandra Bullock. Uh, if, <laughs> if you can do that with a celebrity, surely you can do this with regular people. Number 11. The next person I'm about to show you is Don Roy King, who worked at CBS until 2006 and actually was in charge of pretty much every live Survivor finale and reunion show until his departure. He gives his perspective on how he thought the show would do before it aired. Survivor came out of nowhere. It's going to be on the CBS schedule, which was suffering badly at the time. And I remember thinking, who cares? <laughs> who will care about these people? Who will care who gets kicked off? How in your world can this be a television show? Well, about three weeks in, I got hooked. I thought, this is, <laughs> this is pretty cool. It's really the dynamics of human interaction and it's a little society that, that, that grows and folds and cheats on each other and they, 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 uh, they plan, they plot against groups and, and, I, and I love the production values. I thought, this, is, this show is so fun to watch. It really is like a real life soap opera. It's got soap opera and manipulations and interactions and characters that, that, that emerge and I got to know those people and I thought, I love this show. <laughs> I think it is cool to get the perspective of someone who wasn't all in on the project, but still worked for CBS. It's a very unique perspective. Number 12. Originally, Les Moonves did not want to order a whole season of an unknown show at once. It is pretty standard for television to pay for one episode, a pilot, and see how it fares with viewers before ordering more episodes. Well, Survivor, with the way it's formatted, would not be able to work properly if they did that. So, Mark Burnett had an idea to get the show paid for. But, you know, we do pilots. We don't give 13 hours on the air to untested network producers. And I explained I couldn't do a pilot because there's no point, right? There's gotta be an end game. So I didn't want to do a, a special or a pilot. So I pitched him right there and then on the concept, which I'd learned through Eco Challenge, a sponsorship, and said, yeah, let's look at this like the Olympics. What if we found a series of sponsors who bought into not only some commercial on the show, but the associative marketing values. And Leslie stopped and said, well, that's interesting. Number 13. How exactly was the location of Borneo picked for season one? It isn't a place I could have picked on any map, and yet it seems almost random considering all the other cool places Survivor has gone to over the years. Well, according to Mark Burnett. What I especially liked about Pula Tiga was I'd seen it on a documentary, a National Geographic documentary years earlier called The Eagle and the Snake. I knew that my vision was an inhospitable place for humans. Well, on this island in Borneo, I had you know, monkeys um, everywhere. I had rats everywhere, which is what attracted the snakes ashore every night to eat the rats. Eagles. Um, Sharks and what it was, everything you name it, it was epic. Number 14, I must say, the lighting at Tribal Council has been really inconsistent over the years in terms of how well things are lit and the colors chosen. Sometimes it's really red and that's usually standard. Sometimes it's green though, and sometimes it is too dark for anyone to see who is there. Now, normally in my videos, I color grade the footage to make it easier to see and enhance the image. That's what I'm gonna do for the rest of this video. But for this secret, I am not touching the footage at all. So when Mark and Jeff explain the decisions behind it, you see it as it was originally intended. I remember when the lighting was first done on Tribal Council, which we built Tribal Council, and I went for the first lighting test, and I, my, my comment was, I feel like I'm in Yankee Stadium, like with floodlights on me. And they said, but that's television lighting. I said, but I don't want that. Turn the lights around at the trees and just leave it ambient and make the light the glow from the fire. I want to make sure that the survivors who step onto Tribal Council believe they're at a sacrifice. Red at Tribal, fire. And in, it, in some of our seasons of fire, especially before HD, some of our seasons, Tribal Council is hard to see. It's not lit like a game show, but for the most part, right. that center fire is putting That's off a, source. A, a lot of source. Yeah. And then he was very clear when they leave, the second they leave tribal council, it's blue. 
And so that was very important to him. Number 15, why 39 days? We all know that season two experimented with 42 days, a mistake, and seasons 41 and 42 were forced to have 26 days due to the COVID rules along with contracts made with Fiji. But why 39 days in all the other seasons of the show? Well, as Jeff Probst explains, 39 started because of how many episodes we had and how many days we thought we needed to have enough reality to fill an episode. And that's what we've stayed with, is basically three day episodes. Number 16, the way they cast people is wild. I don't think I would have said this just watching the show and seeing who is on there, but hearing from former castaways, and now Jeff and Mark talking about the process, I will say that casting is wild. What do you like if somebody pokes you in the chest, which is super annoying? Yeah. Some people get really annoyed. Some people don't seem to mind. But we would take things like a piece of paper and we would hold it up and I'd say, did you see this? And Mark would, and there's nothing on it. Right. It'd be our lunch menu. Right. <laughs> and Mark would go, yeah. And then the guy would go, what? And I go, no, no, it's nothing, man. It's a tendency. It doesn't mean anything. Tendency what? The psych report says you have, you have gay tendencies. It doesn't mean anything. It, you're probably straight. I'm totally straight. Okay, okay, we're just, it says you answered some questions that say you might be aroused by men genitalia and that's all we're talking about. And then you watch how they react. Number 17, Don Roy King was not the only person who thought Survivor would fail. Oh no, Les Moonves was tepid but optimistic and on Howard Stern, they kept promoting the show as if someone would die on it, which is utterly ridiculous of course, but TV Guide had a prediction of their own. TV Guide wrote some article the week before Survivor saying it wouldn't be on a week later. This would be on and off in one week. I needed to choose a genre and stick to it. And this was no definable genre and that won't work on network TV. And you better enjoy the first episode because there won't be a second. Number 18, the cinematography of Survivor is amazing. In season one, it felt very much like a filmic documentary. And as the years have gone on, it has improved so much. Despite an ever shrinking budget, I am surprised with what they can pull off for TV. Well, Mark Burnett approached all of this with a devil may care attitude. As long as it looks good, who cares how we do it and with what equipment we do it with. Other people telling me you can't really mix 35 millimeter, Super 16, Digibeta, and um, Handicams high eights from bought from a retail store because it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good to some film school buff. The audience don't care. It just is how it feels. And all the time we mix all those four. Number 19, who was the last person hired onto the crew? Well, according to Jeff, and this could be hyperbole, it was him. And apparently CBS provided him the wardrobe at the time to wear, which is nothing like what we see in any season. As he says, it was head to toe covered in their logo. Mark said, well, what are you gonna wear? And he had these shirts that CBS had designed and they literally had the CBS insignia with the, this eyeball and CBS right here. And here it said CBS and here it said CBS. And, and I, I, was, I just went, oh man, I just don't, that's not what I'm seeing. This feels like I'm a sports announcer. So we were in Malaysia and we go to this clothing store and the only thing they have are these giant shirts and shorts. Mm -hmm. And if you like, if you really go watch season one, my clothes look like four people. My dad could have worn them. Number 20, before they had ever even filmed episode one of Survivor Borneo, the crew was testing out tribal council with the lighting, the sound, cameras, all that technical stuff that is important. In fact, the rehearsals had someone else entirely being the host and Jeff refused to watch and for good reason. And then he said, they're gonna run a tribal council tonight. We're gonna go check it out. They're, gonna, they're building the set. And we showed up and there was a guy there, Barry, who was running tribal, like practicing a Q and A and testing lighting and where the flame's gonna be. And, and Mark said, let's go watch him and see what he's doing. And I had some instinct and I said, I don't wanna see anybody do it. I, I, this is like birthing something new. You hired me, brother, just let me birth it with you. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'll always be mocking him for the, ne the rest of my career. Number 21, remember when Survivor would pick a brand new location for almost every season in the first 10 years of the show? Pepperidge Farm remembers, and apparently a lot of money, time, and work went into prepping each new location, so I think it makes sense when they eventually moved to using the same location for multiple seasons in a row. Survivor is an enormous production, and some of my people are on each location for a total of six months. Big feature crew, mainly out of Australia, 
They're building roads, building sanitation, literally building roads that are not there, which are leave behinds for the community. Number 22, how many hours of footage is filmed in three days and then eventually cut down to 42 minutes of television? Automatically, you would assume, well, three days, that means they have 72 hours of footage, right? But no, with multiple cameras running at all times, it is so much more than even I could imagine. Around about 300 hours to one probably ratio two teams of composers per episode. Number 23, every episode of the show features confessionals from castaways in different locations away from camp where they talk about what is happening on the island, where they are emotionally and strategically. But how long does it take to film these? They'll be in the river shooting an interview for an hour. They'll have leeches crawling up and into orifices in their body. They don't stop. Look at this one got me here, this one got me here, and the third one you can't see, but it's, I got it out. Number 24, the players who were voted off before the jury phase of the game do not go home, contrary to what everyone says on the show, nor do they stay at the jury house, AKA Ponderosa. Here is Jeff explaining what exactly happens with them. They would love to go home, but because we don't want people to know the outcome, we want everyone to come home at once, Part of the contract is you, you have to stay the 39 days. Once we have the entire non-jury group, we send them on some sort of a adventure. So they might go fishing or scuba diving or whatever, but we'll send them on a trek for the last 15 days of the game. Number 25, spoilers exist for almost every season of the show before it airs and during it which sucks, but hey, it seems almost impossible for them not to exist. Every time when the season ends, Jeff will do his best to pitch to those who played not to spoil anything, please. After our final tribal council, I say the same thing. I say, look, it's your show, it's in your hands. We've invested a lot, millions and millions of dollars in this season of Survivor. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. The longer you're in the game, the more invested you are in keeping the secret. If you're the second one out and you got a bone to pick with Survivor because now you feel like, Pfft, I wasted 39 days on this damn thing, then you're more likely to try and spread information. Number 26, when Mark met Jeff Probst and interviewed him, he roasted him. He said, this job isn't for you, Jeff, and basically just put him down to see if Jeff would crack. And I spent 45 minutes of an hour telling him why he couldn't do this and shouldn't do this job. Because there was no babysitting for some star. It might live in a tent, might not get much water or food, get bitten by bugs, chased by snakes. It's gonna be a crappy job if you wanna be in LA. And he, just said, he didn't say a word, he listened for 45 minutes and then started laughing. So I've been here for 45 minutes, I haven't said a word yet. I really wanna do this. Number 27, did you know that Phil Kogan, the now host of The Amazing Race and Tough As Nails, was the only other finalist considered to be the host of Survivor? Imagine if he and Jeff had swapped places, Survivor would probably be a much kinder game. Well, anyways, here's why Mark picked Jeff over Phil. I found two people that I believed in. Jeff was one of those two. The other was Phil Kogan, who went on to become the host of Amazing Race. I'm hiring talent for a network show. I thought the way it worked is CBS would tell me once I'd narrowed it down. He said, your show, buddy. Who are you hiring? I said, they're both great, but my instinct's telling me Jeff Probst. He said, you have a host. Number 28, how did Jeff find out he was the host of Survivor? Through a phone call? Did Mark personally visit him at his house? Nope, while on a dinner date with some lady who has no part in making the show. I went to dinner over the weekend with the sister of one of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to me, she had just had dinner with Gen Maynard in a bizarre world and he tells her, he says, we have this new show we're doing, Survivor, and I've, I've, we've just hired the host, Jeff Probst. They hadn't hired me, I didn't know. I'm at home all weekend going, did I get it, did I get it? Number 29, Survivor hadn't quite figured out the right way to do rewards in season one. They thought that one beer or a slice of pizza would motivate these players to do these massive grueling challenges. They were wrong as they nearly had a mutiny on their hands in season one, so they threw together a reward at the last second to appease the sponsors and appease the players. But we hadn't figured out that they needed to escalate. You know, like the hierarchy of needs, you can't give somebody a steak and then the next time give them a piece of bread. They're like, but I already had a steak. Prize was going to be one cold beer. That was the prize. And we thought, that sounds pretty cool. And so word gets to the, tree mail gets to the tribes, they read it. And Richard Hatch says, basically, a beer? Let's just don't do it. 
let's just tell him, let's show up and say, we're not gonna do it. We want something <laughs> else. He was holding us hostage and Mark goes, I got it. Okay, this is what it is. Jeff, when they get here, you tell them a cold beer, you wait for Richard to bite, and then you say, I wasn't finished. It's a cold beer and as much spaghetti as you can eat while you watch the first 15 minutes of the show you are starring in. Wow. And it worked, Richard, everybody was like, Oh my God, Richard, you're such an idiot. This is a great reward. <laughs> Number 30, what is Survivor all about? Big moves, epic blindsides, having compelling confessionals, controlling the game from beginning to end? No, in fact, Mark Burnett knew before the show ever aired what really mattered and why the format would be so compelling for years to come. But the end game is that when there's a couple left are uh, appealing to the very people they eliminated to give them a gift of a million dollars. It's a management training exercise about kindness and the way you treat others. Because the harsher you treat them, the more unfair you are, the less likelihood they're gonna give you a gift of a million dollars. Number 31, every day Survivor production has a meeting that gets everyone caught up on what is happening with the players in the game at their camps and what the crew needs to focus on as a result. Jeff, however, avoids these meetings like the plague to make tribals authentic. We have daily downloads every night, and theoretically I'm supposed to go to those meetings, but I don't go to them because I don't really need to know and I don't want to know. I, I, I pride myself on the fact that while I do know some stuff going into tribal, I don't know enough that it prohibits me from asking the questions that the audience will want asked. Number 32, how much do the crew interact with the cast? Do they have to stay silent? Can they have full-blown conversations? Has these interactions changed or evolved at all over the years? Why doesn't Jeff Probst go on rewards with the players anymore? In the beginning, everybody's watch was covered in tape. There was no talking whatsoever from the crew. Over the years, we've realized that there was a certain amount of isolation that maybe worked against us because they, they felt, they might've felt a little disconnect. So now the cameraman could be friendly in terms of good morning, but they don't say, hey, my name's Rob. It's good to meet you, man. I got kids too. I heard you talking about right. you. No, that doesn't happen. Right because the deprivation is part of the show. That's why I don't go on rewards anymore. That Number 33, the survivor challenges certainly have been simplified a lot over the years in comparison to how elaborate they used to be. But no matter what, the crew plans out all the different angles and even have people hiding in camouflage to get better angles. And you put all the pieces together with our point of view cameras that are shoved in little places and our guys in camo that are sometimes in the middle of a challenge and you don't even see them because they're camoed like they're part of the challenge and they're getting the cross by, all of a sudden you've got this really amazing challenge that you did once. Number 34, on TV the explanation given for each challenge is short but sweet. We see the dream team perform them so we can visually understand what Jeff is saying, but what about for the castaways? Do they get any more details than what we see on TV? I give a really quick on camera yeah. um, description of the challenge just simply because we don't want to waste show time going into the details. And then we walk them through and they can ask questions as much as they want. We always want them to succeed. Number 35, final secret of this video. How long will Jeff Probst host Survivor and is he considering ever passing the baton to someone else? I think I gotta host Survivor till it's over. I, and on the other hand, why would I leave? I still enjoy it. The only drag about Survivor is being away so long. So which secret blew your mind the most? Comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.